Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us virtually here today for the University of Chicago Center for Effective Government Municipal Governance Symposium, sponsored by the Center for Effective Government and Crane's Chicago Business. My name is Sadia Sindhu, and I serve as the Executive Director of the Center for Effective Government, housed here at the Harris School of Public Policy. I'm thrilled to have a chance to say a few words about our work at the Center and kick off what promises to be a generative, timely discussion with our panel today. The Center for Effective Government has a vital and ambitious mission to strengthen democratic institutions and improve the capacity of government to solve public problems. Through our work, we seek to generate and elevate ideas from scholars and experts into the public square. Events like today's, which bring together experts and practitioners to consider pressing issues and means of reform are an essential component of this work. As part of our effort to dive into issues of government reform and democracy right here at home in Chicago, this past Monday, we launched an exciting new multi-part series with Crane's Business Chicago called One City, 50 Wards. This partnership brings together local leaders and experts for an in-depth discussion and dialogue to better understand the options, weigh the trade-offs, and consider the best levers to make our city government more effective. We hope you'll follow along with the series for these next few months with new articles coming out every Monday morning. You can also learn more by visiting our website, www.effectivegov.uchicago.edu and at Crane's Business Chicago at chicagobusiness.com. There you can sign up for our newsletters and for regular updates on our work and events. You can also find us on Twitter at uchicagoceg and at Crane's Chicago. Lastly, for all of those who are tuning in today, you are an important part of this conversation and we've reserved a good chunk of time at the end for Q&A. Please feel free to drop a question for the panel using our Q&A function. I'll be sure to pass a few and hopefully many of them along. With that, I'd like to thank you all for being here today and I'll turn it over to my colleague, Dylan Schaefer. Dylan is an assistant director at the Center for Effective Government and he will introduce our distinguished panelists. Dylan. Thank you so much, Sadia, and good afternoon, everyone. It's my pleasure to be here today and have the opportunity to introduce our panel of experts, starting first with Jessica Tromstein. Jessica is a professor and department head at the University of California, Merced. She is the UC Merced Foundation Board of Trustees presidential chair and studies American politics with a focus on subnational politics, primarily concerning our large cities. Her work studies the process and quality of representation. Jessica, welcome. Next is Christopher Berry. Uh, Chris is the William J. and Alicia Townsend Friedman Professor at the University of Chicago Harris School of Public Policy and at the college. He is also the academic director of the Center for Municipal Finance. His research interests include American politics, metropolitan governance, municipal finance, and intergovernmental fiscal relations. Chris is also the author of Imperfect Union, Representation and Taxation in Multi-Level Governments. Chris, welcome. Next up is Greg Hines. Greg is a Cranes blogger and columnist on politics and government in Chicago, Illinois, and the nation. A prize-winning reporter, Greg also writes frequently on such public policy issues as education, transportation, and economic development. Greg is a graduate of Northwestern University's Medill School of Journalism. He took a brief leave of absence from journalism to serve as press secretary for the Carter Mondale campaign in Illinois in 1980. Greg, so great to have you. And last but not least is Justin Marlowe. Justin is a research professor in the University of Chicago Harris School of Public Policy. His research and teaching are focused on public finance with emphasis on public capital markets, infrastructure finance, state and local budgeting, and financial disclosures. He also currently serves as Editor-in-Chief of Public Budgeting and Finance. Justin, great to have you. Thanks for joining us. And lastly, I'm thrilled to introduce our moderator this afternoon, Professor William G. Howell. William is the Sidney Stein Professor in American Politics at the University of Chicago, where he holds appointments in the Harris School, the Political Science Department, and the College. Currently, he is the director of the Center for Effective Government, as well as the co-host of Not Another Politics podcast. He's written widely on separation of powers issues in American political institutions, particularly the presidency. His current work um, is related to separation of powers issues, the origins of political authority, the normative foundations of executive power, and much, much more. Um, Will, so great to have you, and it's my pleasure to turn it over to you to get us started tonight. Great. Hey, thank you, 
Dylan, and thank you, Sadia, for for all you've done to pull us together um, uh, in the service of this conversation, which I've been looking forward to. Um, we're in the middle of an election here in Chicago. To be more exact, we're in the middle of many elections here in Chicago. Um, and the conversation come election time typically focuses on the individuals who are running for office, their experience, their platforms, their personalities, and with good reason. Um, but these individuals are running for offices in reasonably well-defined institutions that are going to shape what their subsequent behavior is. Um, and the design of those institutions have implications for what issues they lift up, how they run, um, how they engage with one another, and how they uh, address the profound challenges that our, our city faces. And when we think about the, the city council in particular, which is the topic of our conversation, ours is something of a peculiar institution. Um, we have 50 members who uh, occupy the city council. This is um, has been true for the last 100 years. It was 100 years ago um, uh, in um, exactly that we moved from a situation where we went from having 35 wards that each elected two people to having 50 wards, each electing one. And we haven't given that up in the hundred years since. Um, it's worth noting that this is truly exceptional when you look at other cities around the country. If you look at the top 10 biggest cities around the country, New York has 51, um, but New York is also more than three times our size. Um, and the next largest um, among the top 10 cities in the country, the next largest city council is Houston's coming in at 17. Um, LA has 15 and and they're they're even smaller if you if you go down the down the list and on a per capita basis um we are a huge outlier we have um each each member of our city council represents roughly, roughly 50,000 people um and in a, the, the average among the other top 10 cities around the country it's more like 220 250,000 people represented by a city council member and we want to think about what that means for our city, what it means for the behavior of the city council um, and how they engage our politics. And to get us started, I'm hoping I can turn to you first, Greg. You've been covering city politics here in Chicago for a good long time. Um, and I'm really interested in what you've seen, um, how uh, the design of this institution has informed the politics that unfolds. And if you might say a little bit about um, your thoughts about how the how the fact that we have 50 individually elected um city council members um the the significance of that for the kinds of issues that get traction in our politics and the kinds of issues that maybe struggle to get traction in our politics here in chicago um happy to will um uh government is this funny beast as we all know uh, we depend on it we need it but we hate it at the same time uh the, the trick is always in life is to uh is to, is to get things right and have a government that's responsive, that you can find out something from, but one that doesn't you up in the process. I'll give you two stories. So we're talking about politics here. So politics, so stories is, is appropriate. Um, uh, there used to be a guy named George Dunn, who was the committeeman of the uh, 42nd Ward on the North Side. Uh, the alderman essentially reported to the committeeman and he was God master of his turf. Uh, you didn't do anything that he didn't want you to do. I got a call once from a political operative buddy of mine who was opening, who had a client who was opening a restaurant in the 42nd Ward. And uh, the guy invested a lot of money, uh, arranged to have a, a loading per permit uh, in front of his restaurant so that people could come up and drop off uh, patrons or whatever. Uh, so about a week out, he gets a visit from somebody representing the alderman and the committeeman. And the guy says, uh, uh, you know, as a, as a, since you're going to serve liquor, you're going to need dram shop insurance. And you're aware, of course, that uh, Mr. Dunn sells insurance. And the guy kind of looked at it and says, uh, okay, I will keep that in mind, but I've already arranged for dram shop insurance. So nothing happens until uh, the day before the restaurant's supposed to open up when a couple of city workers come up, take away the loading dock signs. And the guy is... What do I do? I, I can't, my people can't drop their, off their things. He gets a call the next morning from some, somebody representing the alderman and the committeeman saying, that, uh, are you sure about that dram shop insurance? George would be happy to serve your needs. That's one side, one extreme. Another side, another example on the other side, 
uh, during the Seven Day War, Six Day War in uh, in, in Israel back in the uh, a while ago now. But uh, anybody, any student of history will know that um, a resident of a North Side Ward, uh, her daughter was flying to Israel, and the war broke out. And the parent was absolutely frantic as to how do I find my kid? What's going on? Is she safe or whatever? Um, who does she call? She called the State Department. Does she call the Israeli embassy? She calls her alderman, who proceeds to find out the daughter is safe. Uh, my point is that is anything else in life, you have to strike the right balance here. Government can be voracious, but government, and in, and in the case of Chicago, local government, uh, gives a point of contact because nothing is worse than dealing with bureaucracies don't, that don't listen to anybody. Uh, so I think the question here is, is here in Chicago, is how do we find the sweet spot? Yeah, and you you just pointed us towards two extremes. On the one hand, they're dealing with the hyper, hyper local. And on the other hand, they're intervening on the absolutely global. Um, um, Jessica, if I could turn to you and, and help us think through, um, I mean, you've written a ton on local politics. You've written quite a bit on Chicago in particular. How are we to think about the size of a city council? I mean, we just sort of like the numbers of people involved, and and the fact that they're 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 elected at in in wards. They're not at large uh, races, and it's that significance for the kinds of things that Greg just identified. The, the what kinds of policies they go after, how they engage certain certain kinds of issues, and are there certain kinds of issues that city councils, not just here in Chicago, but more generally, um, struggle to to grapple with because of how they're designed. Yeah, absolutely. So um, sort of picking up on what Greg was talking about, the structure of the Chicago city government offers a variety of different opportunities for people to uh, entrench their power. And they can entrench their power for, for a variety of different reasons. But one is which something that you just touched on, Will, which is that the small scale of representation, right? Representing only 50,000 residents as opposed to say 250, 300,000 residents offers the opportunity um, for a lot more interaction and a lot more contact with constituents than you see in other cities. And the, the ward system, having neighborhoods represented by a particular council member um, is another component of, of power, right? So if neighborhoods have the ability to dictate what goes on in their neighborhood and to make sure that their needs and their um, and their interests are represented on the city council, that creates a situation where neighborhoods can be um, sort of kings of their own, they, they have their own little kingdoms. And so it, what that means is there's a trade-off here, just sort of as Greg was talking about, between getting things, getting protection and getting um, getting representation for neighborhoods can make it difficult to get representation for the whole city. And we can see that in lots of different kinds of research. And to the extent that any one alderman or council member um, has the power to ensure that nothing happens in their, uh, in their ward that their constituents don't want, um, that offers on the one hand, the opportunity for incredible representation and the, the opportunity for, for people's needs and their, their, political, uh, the, their political efficacy to be very high. But at the same time, it can be extremely difficult for cities to govern as a whole because sometimes what's good for one neighborhood isn't what's good for the city as a whole. And those are the kinds of trade-offs that institutional structures provide. Can I lift one particular issue that is something that the city of Chicago obviously faces a challenge um, as a whole, and it's something that you've done a fair bit of writing on, which is segregation. Yeah. Efforts to grapple with that as an issue. How, how when you when when you have a city council that's designed on a ward based base on a on, on a ward basis, does that facilitate or impede the efforts of individuals who are interested in attending to this the the, the many and 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 the, and the profound challenges associated with segregation. Yeah, so segregation has been a part of the fabric of our cities since the early 1900s. This is not a new problem. And, and in each decade we have become more segregated in different ways. Um, and there, there's a sort of complicated history there. But what the, the point is, is that it's very difficult to undo segregation once it's in place. And so now we're in a situation where all that's required to maintain segregation is to block. 
And going back to what I just said a minute ago, which is that if any one ward wants to block development or block integration or block changes to the character of their neighborhood, that's a term that gets used a lot um, in segregation conversation, that the power of a, of a single alderman to ensure that their neighborhood, that their community is protected from unwanted development means that it's extremely difficult to undo segregation once it's in place. And as you all know, Chicago has a long history um, of being one of the most segregated cities in America. And so if I could just push you just one more and then I'm, and then I'm gonna come to you, Justin, which is, it, is, it, is it too strong to say that the design of our city council aids and abets the persistence of segregation. That is, if what you wanted to do was combat segregation, you ought to get into the business of thinking anew about the design of this particular legislative body. I think that's right, but I think it's a little bit more complicated than just a ward versus at-large system. So there are ways within ward systems or within districted systems to generate uh, citywide consensus or citywide programming um, that is uh, that that allows single districts or single wards um, to not have complete power within their boundaries. So, so yes, I would say that the institutional structure of Chicago and many other cities um, aids and abets segregation, but the solution isn't necessarily, the flip side is not necessarily that if we had an at-large system, we would suddenly see integration in Chicago. I don't think that's the case. So, I, you know, I, I think that there's a more nuanced answer to what the institutional, the right institutional design is in order to produce more and equitable development across cities. Justin, you've been doing a, a lot of thinking and, and work on municipal finance. Um, when we think about the city's budget and the challenges that face it and the pension problems that we as a city confront, um, how would you characterize the city council's engagement of that issue? Again, and the point here is not to point fingers at any particular older person, um, and to say this is a champion or a foe of good governance, but to think about as a whole, as a structure, how do they tend to engage the issue? Um, and is there any slippage between the nature of their engagement and the nature of the problem itself? Yeah, great question. And thanks for the chance to, to be here and discuss uh, these important issues. I think for, as a student of budgeting and finance, the thing that we see in Chicago and, and other cities that have similar, that are similarly structured, at least with respect to a lot of local politics, a lot of board-based politics, um, a lot of fragmentation of the sort that we see here, is we see budgeting and finance processes that are really good at giving residents what they want, but may not be very good at giving residents what they need. And what we mean by that is when you think about what you might want at the local level, it's a lot of the kinds of things we've talked about already. Strong representation, good responsiveness, a lot of that kind of very local flavor and thinking about services that are delivered block by block, neighborhood by neighborhood. Uh, Chicago is exceedingly good at that. Um, maybe some quite a bit of variation from one ward to the next, but in the aggregate is generally seen as a place that does a really good job with constituent services and, and delivering services at the ground level. The challenge there then is that same structure, especially when it comes to making budgets and allocating resources does not do a particularly good job of thinking about what we might need, which are those longer, big picture, more abstract kinds of financial concerns like pensions, like do we have an appropriate amount of debt, like are we maintaining our infrastructure, especially the, the, ma the maintenance part of infrastructure that's not nearly as visible and not nearly as exciting as ribbon cuttings and building new stuff. Those big picture questions tend to really fall off the radar of, of uh, members of the city council for some, some reasons that are technical and structural and some that are really political. I think it goes back to the point that, that Jessica made a second ago. There's a tendency um, because the council is has very little formal engagement and very little capacity really to analyze the budget. There's a tendency to think of the budget as something the mayor owns. And then as a result, much like with planning and zoning decisions, there's the ability to simply say no and reject what the mayor is proposing. And that takes a lot of that attention off of those big picture, longer term issues and puts them back at the neighborhood level. And so what you get is this tendency to kind of ignore those big picture, long term issues. And the next thing you know, you have billions of dollars in, in unfunded pension liabilities. I think there's a very clear relationship there between just the way that we think about allocating resources and the amount of attention that's paid to those bigger picture concerns. The question then becomes what to do about it. 
and much like the reforms that we've been talking about so far, one of the things that we see when we study budgets um, is that you the the old saying that uh, sort of culture eats strategy for lunch very much applies here. You can reform the budget, you can change the way that you make the budget, but there's always this tendency for the political culture to take those reforms and make them into what the political culture wants those reforms to be. So we can think about reforming the budget any number of different ways, changing what type of information is brought to bear on the budget. Think about changing uh, the degree to which we have legislative staffs that might do more analysis and, and thinking about the budget. We can think about ways that we uh, engage citizens in the bigger picture issues differently. There's certainly been some of that in Chicago with participatory budgeting and some of the other reforms that we've had. But there's a tendency always for those reforms to be captured and ultimately turned into whatever it is that uh, aldermen and, and the mayor's staff really need them to be. The irony, of course, with all of that is that a lot of those reforms have grown out of Chicago. The, the Institute for Public Administration right on our campus is, has been and for, for many years was the main source of intellectual energy behind the progressive movement, reforming budgets, thinking a lot about what a better government system looks like. And yet, just a, a few blocks away, we didn't necessarily see a lot of those reforms take hold. So we think about the budget and the budget process and the way that the structure we're describing plays into it. Again, I think that creates this tension between what we what we want and what we need, and we get a lot more of the former, and or we get a lot more of the, of the former and a lot less of the latter. Where what we need is a budget that's responsible and doesn't incur too much debt and is attentive to citywide issues. Um, and what we have is one that's hypersensitive to not just super local, but I also heard you say, Justin, short term um, concerns. And so if you introduce a, a budget, a comprehensive new budget that's going to introduce some big changes system wide that may be in the best interest of Chicago as a whole, but they mm, they bother some powerful interest locally, you can expect that alderman to stand up and and make life difficult. And in, 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 in is that and do you want to say that that is an important reason why, I mean, I think you do, why we have the kinds of unbelievable pension liabilities that we do in this city. It's the inability for the attention to the long-term and the citywide issues that are born of these institutional commitments. I mean, you were talking about in terms of culture, but it is, the culture is itself, it's coming out of, we've got people who are running for office representing individual wards one at a time. And the way that they stay in office is by attending to short-term local concerns. It definitely, it's definitely, definitely a feedback loop there. Yep. Yeah. Well, let me jump in on this in a couple of points. Please. Um, uh, the construct here is, ab is absolutely right uh, that, uh, that uh, uh, people don't, what people want and what people need are not always the same thing. But that, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't want to be overly simplistic, but that's what you get with democracy. Uh, and the implied solution to this is to, uh, to uh, effectively take power out of the hands of local groups and put it in the hand of a presumably uh, 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 well-intentioned citywide force, in this case, the mayor, uh, doesn't necessarily have it uh, come without pitfalls either. Um, uh, one of the reasons I, I think that nationally, probably I suspect to the chagrin of most of the people listening here, is that Donald Trump has been able to uh, uh, score through and, the, and, uh, and conservatives have been able to make political points is because they're able to say, oh, those folks, they don't care what you want. They're going to tell, they're going to impose something on you. Uh, so I, I talked before about balance. You have to find, uh, you have to find a way to inject local democracy and local responsiveness, which at, at core is good, uh, without so empowering it that, that the kinds of things that need to be done for the body politic as a whole uh, don't get accomplished. It's, it's, it's a difficult walk to walk. And so there are trade-offs that run through this. And the question is, do we are we striking them reasonably well? The pensions would suggest probably not. The persistence of segregation is Probably not. There another big issue that um, you pointed to at the top, 
uh, Greg, is the issue of corruption um, and the long-standing challenges associated with political corruption and the long history that we have of it in this city. And 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 Chris, if I could turn to you, ought we to think about how are we to think about both here at Chicago and also sort of more generally this relationship between political crush, corruption and the design of of our political institutions generally and, and the design of our city councils in particular? Yeah, I'll answer that by uh, situating in some of the comments that have been, been made before. I mean, I think there's a, there's a well-known trade-off in thinking about decentralization between giving power uh, to the local level, which has some really desirable uh, uh, byproducts, which is we, we think particularly in a 50 uh, a ward system that, that, that these representatives are closer to the people, they'll have better information, they'll be better, better able to represent what their immediate constituents want. And the usual flip side of that, when we talk about well, what's the trade-off, um, is that they might be, do things that are you know, bad for the city overall, that the interests of the ward are not the same as the city. And so for instance, maybe we need to situate some undesirable local use like a prison or or a uh, or, or a, tr a trash incinerator, and but we give every ward a veto over that, you know, then then it never gets built. And so that's the way we usually kind of frame this trade off and, and try to strike a balance. I think one of the things that's often overlooked in a system like Chicago's is this this other kind of trade off is that by giving such authority to the, a local political figure like uh, an older person, you're really giving them control of a very very valuable. A resource and Greg's opening anecdote was an example of one of those, which is the, the the power to approve local businesses. And when put in the wrong hands, uh, that power can be turned toward toward corruption. I think that's an often overlooked kind of uh, a byproduct of this sort of decentralization. And when you look at a lot of the corruption scandals that are that have erupted around the city council, a lot of them have involved the abuse of this uh, local uh, sort of quasi you know fief like uh, power that the local alders have. Now, before we go out too far down the road and saying that that is probably the cause, you know, look where we're located in Illinois, and we've seen the same problems of corruption at every level of government, including those that are not fragmented at all, going all the way to, you know, Blagoje Blagojevich's trouble as governor, where he wasn't, uh, he had a single, uh, you know, control over a great resource, which was a senatorial appointment. Um, and we saw similar problems. So I think this question that Justin raised of the culture of a place is very hard, I think, it's a chicken and egg question. You know, is, is, is Chicago corrupt because the council uh, structure enabled this kind of corruption? Did the council structure, uh, you know, maybe was, was fine, but the culture of corruption played out there in a way. What's clear is I think the interaction between the two um, has been problematic in a lot of ways, though, uh, you know, we, there's always a trade-off, and and it, it is true that you can in Chicago you can call your older person and and get a response, you know, pretty quickly and get get a lot of things done. Chris, you in the last several years have been doing a, a lot of work on property taxes and um, the profound inequalities built into um, property taxes um, and the racial disparities associated with those inequalities. And I wonder if you could just say a little bit about like what the big ticket issue is here, if you could, um, and then characterize the nature of the city council's response to or engagement with the problem. This isn't to say that the problem falls squarely on the city council, that there are obligations at um, um, for, for at the county level and, and for the mayor, but how would you characterize the, to the extent that the city council is getting engaged and offering leadership in this space, how do they get engaged? Yeah, so just at a high level for those who, who aren't you know, enmeshed in this, you know, the problem in Cook County, but lots of other places too, is that property taxes have been highly inequitable for a very long time. Assessors have systematically sort of overassessed people who own the lowest value properties while giving big breaks to people who own the most valuable properties. Uh, again, those who follow Cook County politics will know we had a, an election about this and we got, you know, a new assessor as a result. But that's the kind of high level problem. And I, and I think it gives us, you know, a window into, into thinking about our local institutions in ways that go beyond the city council, because I think one of the lessons from thinking about this policy problems is if you can't really look at the city council in isolation and ask, you know, uh, how its structure uh, affects its performance, because our, our whole local government is so highly fragmented. And that's true in Illinois, it's true in Cook County, we have many, many different jurisdictions with many powers. And so in this question of assessing, that's in fact a county function, really, that, that city councilors don't have direct uh, you know, control over. Um, so you might ask, well, how's the county commission doing that? That's a much smaller body. It's a 17 for the whole county. So you might, ah, 
they've got the right formula. They must be doing a good job. Well, they didn't do a good job. <laughs> you know, they didn't really provide oversight. They kind of cowered at the prospect of, of even getting involved. Um, and, and so another perhaps clue that it can't all just be the structure of, of the city council because we look at another institution with a different structure and performs equally poorly. Now, what did the city council itself do? I mean, to the extent that the older people really got involved in this at all, it was very much focused on their own wards, which gets back to this, that's good. On the one hand, what did they do? They ran a lot of workshops in their own wards to help people appeal their taxes. So that's that's good, that's responsive. I mean, your alderman was trying to help you get a break for, from these unfair taxes, and a lot of them would, would, would point to that. But the flip side is we didn't really have anyone looking to the big picture because power is so fragmented. And I think we talk about these wards as little fiefs, and often the focus is on the fief part, how powerful the alderman is within that little area. But we all also want to focus on the little part of the little fief. It's a very little area where they have a lot of power, but nobody really has a lot of power over the big picture. And in that kind of a fragmented system, it's often a political party or a party boss of some kind that emerges and, you know, as we saw in the assessing case where that party boss was Joe Burials, uh, that didn't work towards reform, that, that, that worked against it. And the, and the party often fills in for the kind of authority, the kind of unifying authority that doesn't exist within the governmental structure in Cook County. Jessica, can you put Chicago, a little, I mean, you've written a, a lot about Chicago, but you've, you've looked at a lot of cities around the country. Um, when you think about, and if we, again, you've written a bunch on segregation, you could take that issue, but take an issue of your choosing. You think about the design of the um, the city council here and how different it is from other major metropolitan areas. Are there points of comparison that are worth lifting up here? So if you look at, you know, LA has what, 15 city council representatives. Do they, is there reason to believe that they can get traction in attending to citywide challenges in ways that it's harder for us here in Chicago? Or or is or do you I, want I, to say that every city is a, a city unto itself and it's all very contextual and, and we can't draw any generalizations? Well, no, because I'm a political scientist and yeah, I would be out of a job if I, if I agreed with that right. statement. So, um, I, you know, I think the research actually indicates that hybrid systems offer some of the best chances for um, meaningful reform. And I, I just, I want to sort of, before I say more about hybrid systems, I just want to point out that Chicago, as, as powerful as the political culture is in Chicago, and as long standing as many of the problems that each of you have discussed are in Chicago, there have been institutional changes in Chicago that have actually changed politics. And I'll, just one example of this is, you know, for a very long time, um, all political, all hiring, all municipal hiring was uh, was done on a patronage basis, right? Who you know and how 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 you how you get your job is is based on this sort of informal network structure. Um, Formal, formally outside of the government. And uh, not only getting your job was part of the patronage system, but also losing your job was part of the patronage system. And one of the big changes that was made in, in Illinois politics a long time ago was to prohibit political firing in a way that, um, that actually, for at least a brief time, um, changed how hiring and fire, how hiring happened um, in Chicago politics. And so it's just one little point to make, which is that there can be institutional changes that really can affect on the ground aspects of corruption and segregation um, and fi financial control. But sometimes it's difficult to figure out exactly what that institutional change is. So my research suggests that one of the most effective reforms that cities can engage in is a sort of hybrid system. So, and there are two ways in which hybrid systems are, are important. One is to have representation at the ward level so that neighborhoods do have a voice, but also to have some portion of the city council elected citywide. Not that that, so, so it's what's problematic is when you expect for the citywide focus to be held, uh, to be held by a, a separate branch, right? So now you have your your aldermen who are all locally focused and you have a mayor who is supposed to be city focused, but those are separate branches of government. So one effective reform can be to have some citywide members of the city council um, participate in the, in the decision-making that happens at the aldermanic level. Another kind of reform, hybrid reform, is to have both a mayor and a city manager. Um, so, you know, to, to, to make sure that there are, uh, to, to create 
to, to draw on some of the benefits of having um, sort of this administrative structure as well as the political structure. Politics is good. We need politics for representation. Um, but uh, as Greg sort of started us off, we need balance, right? Democracy, too much democracy isn't good for the good of the whole. Um, so Jessica, the, the combination of ward plus at large, um, does your research suggest that there's an appropriate balance, one, like, what does that look like? I mean, is it is it a couple? Uh, proportionally, what are we talking about? And how are we to think about um, the total number? Does it, I mean, should does the fact that we have 50 as opposed to 15, is that consequential when you think about striking that balance? It's consequential in the sense that, like, if you think of it, it's sort of step back from city politics and think about the difference between the Senate and the House of Representatives and how much harder it is for the House of Representatives to get things done than it is to get for the Senate to get things done, more people is harder, right? You have more collective action costs, it's harder to get things done. And so larger city councils do tend to be either log rolling where they sort of stay off of each other's turf and allow each member to have control over their jurisdiction or completely contentious so that nothing gets done. So, you know, smaller city councils do tend to have sort of, they tend to be more productive. I wouldn't point to Los Angeles as being the pinnacle of, um, Good governance at the moment, though. So you know, I don't. There's, it, there, there are lots of factors that matter here. I would say, I would say that my my research suggests that if you have about two thirds of the city council uh, elected by district and about a third of the council elected at large, that that can produce some of the the benefits from both sides that I've been talking about. And Justin, imagine we do that here. We go, we move towards incorporating at least some of these seats to be at large. Um, and maybe we think anew about this overall size and say 50, maybe it's a little too high. Um, does that give you any hope when thinking about the city's finances that we might be able to get make some headway in attending to these acute problems in ways that we've struggled to up until now? Yeah, it's a, I, I, mean, I think simple answer is yes. When you look at what a lot of those quote unquote reformed jurisdictions that Jessica was just describing, you look at the way that they make their budgets and the way they think about their long term finances. There's elements that they have that Chicago simply doesn't have. And, and to Greg's point about balance, I think it is fair to say that pretty much anyone who's looked at Chicago's finances would say there are certain things that could be done. If nothing else, just from the perspective of producing of having more and better information as part of the process that could go a long way. And a couple of specific examples come to mind right away. And you almost always see these with more of those reformed hybrid style jurisdictions that, that we've been talking about. You know, one would be a, a much stronger uh, legislative budget analyst function. You know, right now the, the Council Office of Financial Analysis, CUFA, is, is relatively due. They do good work, uh, but I think most would, would say uh, that they're understaffed relative to what they're asked to do. And that is a function that in other jurisdictions really serves an important purpose of being able to give an independent perspective, answering council members' questions about the fiscal impact of proposed legislation and providing more of that kind of jurisdiction level analysis. Other, other Some of the stuff is, is even more basic than that. I mean, Chicago's budget, again, not to disparage the people who work on it because they, they do a, a really impossible task, but there's certain elements that you see other places that are just missing. One is a really careful analysis of what stuff actually costs, uh, taking the time to evaluate the relationship between direct and indirect costs, thinking about those, those pension costs at the departmental level. If we're going to expand, if we're going to do new services, what's that going to do to pension obligations going forward at the, at the department level or at the service level? The Civic Federation and others have called for that for a long time now, you know, that's been absent. There's large parts of Chicago's capital budgeting, how we plan for infrastructure investments that are really underdeveloped relative to uh, many jurisdictions, but especially those, again, that have a little bit more of a, of a hybrid flavor to them. We could do a lot more in terms of planning uh, analysis of, of infrastructure needs at the city level and maybe having more of a trade-off there between maintenance concerns, especially at the city level versus at the at the ward level. And so there's a long list of things that we could do to, to try to, if nothing else, inject new information into the process that might make the job of Alderman a little bit easier when it comes times to think about what the, the bigger picture implications of near-term budget decisions might be. It's interesting, though, no, that the existing city council doesn't 
make those investments in acquiring that information. I mean, one thing that the city council could do is build out the bureaucracy that would furnish them um, such information, but that's a costly undertaking, um, not just to the city, but also in terms of time and attention. Um, and so the bureaucracy in this way, the kinds of information flows themselves are born of the design, the original design of the institution, which is then why, I, I, and Jessica, you're not gonna want me to say this, but I'm gonna say it, which is like the kind of infra intervention that she's pointing us towards is foundational. It may set in motion all kinds of other changes in what kind of information is collected, who's assigned to what kinds of tasks in ways that may be collectively beneficial. Maybe. Okay, so another thing that's in play though, uh, is not just um, what the city council does on its own, but its relationship to the mayor. Greg, you've paid a whole lot of attention, not just to the city council and its internal politics and its internal successes and challenges, but also its relationship to uh, uh, a strong may a historically strong mayor that we have here um if we were to change the city council in ways that jessica suggests um we might what implications do you see that happening for relationships between those two political bodies um jessica's idea of a hybrid system is it's worthy of consideration there's, there's some interesting uh, um, aspects there but Relative to the larger question that we've kind of been talking about, the benefits of centralization versus decentralization, strong mayor, uh, weak city council. Um, uh, Chicago, for at least since Richard J. Daley, uh, has had, uh, you know, in theory, has a strong council form of government. In effect, it has a strong mayor form of government uh, with the city council, uh, given its own little small tidbits, but uh, essentially staying out of the mayor's way and doing what they're told. And on the pension side, that has yielded both good things and bad things. Um, Chicago largely developed its current pension hole uh, under the under the reign of, uh, of Mayor Daley II. Uh, he effectively underfunded it. He ignored it. He wanted to spend the money elsewhere. He didn't want to take uh, politically unpopular uh, tax decisions to deal with it. So he didn't deal with it. Uh, 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 his predecessor, Rahm Emanuel, uh, did deal with it uh, to the extent it's been dealt with. He put finally put Chicago on a, on a path to uh, we're actuarially paying what we're supposed to be paying. Uh, that it was never the case under Daly. We were paying a third or a quarter, if that. Now we're paying what we're supposed to be. Uh, but uh, but at the cost of raising city property taxes through the roof, because that was the revenue source that was available to, to do it. Um, uh, that created a kind of a backlash climate uh, against centralization of mayoral power, even though he was trying to do something in the public interest, I would argue. Um, uh, uh, so you now have, if anything, uh, uh, the public mood in Chicago is calling for more decentralization of power uh, and taking it away from the mayor. We're electing, uh, we're going to elect members of the Chicago School Board pretty soon. Uh, we have uh, uh, we have all these new local uh, police district councils that are going to uh, have some power over who the superintendent is. Uh, whether these things are really going to work or whether in the case of uh, the school uh, board elections, it's just going to turn into one big spending special interest against another, don't know. But uh, but for whatever, whatever it's worth, the trend at the moment in this town seems to be away from a strong mayor. Let's dilute his or her power and, and give it to other people. And I, just said add to what Greg said, I mean, my, my sense is, I mean, you're right, like institutionally or on paper, you know, we, it doesn't look like we have a particularly strong mayor city, but, you know, historically we've had some extremely strong mayors. It's also worth noting we've had some extremely weak mayors uh, as well. And so I think what's happened in Chicago is that the, the, the extent of power has been more a function of personality, political capital, maybe existence or connections to a political machine, which is a you know, topic that Jessica's written about. Uh, and so I'm not sure it's so much that, that we've had strong mayors so much as we've had some strong personalities as mayors that have been able to get a lot done. And, and you know, at, at the moment, we don't maybe we don't want to go too much into current politics. We don't have someone who's perceived as a particularly strong mayor. Um, and, I, and I think that's having its own effects. But, it, but I, I don't think it, it boils down to the institutions uh, so much. Uh, I, I just want to jump in here and say, you know, one of the things that that I think Will is hinting at here in a lot of his questions is, 
how do you get the proper alignment of incentives? And, you know, is it in the interest of somebody in government to pursue a long range plan that balances budgets, you know, and produces a healthy pension? Well, right now, there's that doesn't exist, right? So it's it's in nobody's interest. It's it's never in any elected official's interest to do something that's horrible while they're in office that's going to benefit somebody who's elected to office 20 years later. So the the question is how to create institutional structures that produce the incentives for people to want to work toward those citywide goals. And in some cases, that can be a, a strengthening of the bureaucracy. I want to invite people to submit questions of their own. They're starting to roll in. Um, and there's one at the top that I think is particularly interesting. Um, and, it, and, and it asks, when we think about the benefits or the possible trade-offs of there being one city, might we think that there are certain groups in particular who would want to resist that and justifiably so? And how, and therefore, how ought we to think about not this trade-off in kind of general terms, but in a particularly when it comes to a city that's as diverse economically, ethnically, racially as our own? If So Chris, if I could turn to you, because you, you said like the standard way to think about this is, on, you know, on one hand, we want to think about system-wide, citywide concerns, but then there also are local concerns and how do we find that balance? The, dis the decisions that we might want to make here in Chicago might be informed by the particular demographics of our city in thinking about that. And so how, uh, uh, how, 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 how would you, like if you were to provide counsel in thinking about Chicago in particular, where to strike that balance, well, where would you encourage us to look? You know, I actually think this is another point is going to, in my analysis, another point in favor of a, a kind of hybrid system of the sort Jessica's talking about, or at least the existence of some more at-large figures in politics. I mean, one of the facts about Chicago specifically is we, we don't have a majority uh, uh, racial ethnic group within the city. We're sort of, you know, 30% white, 30% African-American, 30% Latino, and 10% and everybody else. And so the, the nature of a lot of our, our political competition has been, you know, a representative of each of these groups competing, and then there's a runoff with only two, and then they try to form some coalition by attracting the other group. But we, it, we because it's so heavily localized, we tend to get a lot of politicians that represent one of these groups, but not the city. And until a mayoral election takes place and somebody's forced to cobble together such a coalition. And I think so having other at large or citywide elected officials at the county level allows us to be generating other kinds of uh, offices that force people to cobble together these coalitions that bring together the, the various groups in the city. And I think the more opportunities we can create in our institutions to do that, the more offices, the more people we can get who are being forced to put these coalitions that represent everybody together, the better we're going to be. And the more decentralized it is where you know, each person is kind of representing a particular group. And we could go into a lot of examples, but I think the most recent fight over redistricting in the city council, where it was all about you know, how many seats were going to go to this ethnic group or, or, or that racial group as distinct from real citywide concerns is a, is a good example. And so Another advantage to uh, having citywide officials is this, is this, and that that would also create, you know, competitors at the time of a mayoral election, people who already had, you know, a citywide base uh, to run. So I, I think, you know, Chicago is a very interesting city in, in that regard, in terms of our demographic makeup of being more or less equally sized uh, uh, groups of, uh, you know, different backgrounds. Will, can I, can I say something about that question too? So Please. It, it is, um, it was, it's, a, it's an insightful question, in part because historically, there have been reform movements that have argued for citywide reforms that really just substitute one group's preferences for everybody else's preferences. And so it's extremely important in thinking about institutional reforms that you're not just elevating one socioeconomic group or one racial group's concerns and, and saying that is the citywide concern because it's not, right? And so to get back to what Chris is suggesting, what, what is imperative in, in moving forward is creating institutional structures that generate coalition building. One thing to just jump on that real quick too, the, a very good example, I think recently of, of what we're describing here is Seattle. Uh, maybe Jessica's looked at this too, but nine member at large city council, a few years ago, there was a big push, particularly from the business community to, to reform the reform into, into a hybrid council 
with one or two at-large representatives. And the business community's claim very clearly was that they didn't, they couldn't do business uh, with the mayor and they couldn't do business with all these at-large representatives. And they thought that their fortunes would be much better being able to help to finance and stand up local level representation that would reflect their interests. And they were one of the few institute, one of the few interest groups really in, in that community that has the muscle to be able to do that. Uh, so they put it on the ballot, got it passed. And you could argue that that's exactly the kind of substitution that Jessica was describing, where now you have uh, you know, the, the business community being able to, to be the unifying force in a way that government was not able to be on its own. We could debate all day whether that's ultimately been, been good for people there. But that the business community in this story that you're telling, Justice, was one that didn't feel like its voice was heard when all the when when it was all about at large citywide representation, um, and you could substitute business community for any number of other local interests or 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 needs and wants, um, and so that was a shift in the opposite direction of I think the one that we've been talking about for the last fifty minutes, which is we're so hyper local. Might we introduce some at large representation? Like um, a, good, a good, a good, if I might, a good pending example that's in the news here lately is uh, we're going to have this big NASCAR race in downtown Chicago uh, uh, this summer, Fourth uh, of July weekend. It's going to take up uh, most of Grant Park. It's going to close Lakeshore Drive for a while. Uh, the mayor says it's a great thing that we're going. It's going to bring attention and, and uh, jobs and uh, money and. Uh, public interest to, to Chicago after uh, at a time when we really could probably use some good publicity. Uh, but the way the mayor forced it through uh, was uh, she said she decided and presented uh, in a, in a semi-secretive way and, and rammed the thing through and the, the way Chicago uh, mayors do. Uh, uh, a lot of the people who live in the neighborhood surround it, all those people in the high rises uh, around the park, they're not very happy about this. They think their interests weren't reflected. So, you know, who, de who decides there and, and how do you come up to uh, Jessica's uh, suggestion that we need an incentive process to make uh, give people reasons to do the right thing. But what's the right thing in this case? Not quite, not quite sure it's clear cut. Eric asks uh, about the role of machine politics in all of this and how it influences um, or provides a solution to the problems of um, city councils or displaces those problems. We've got a long history of machine politics here in Chicago and they've kind of come and gone, um, even as, as, I've, as I said at the top, the size of our city council has been stuck at 50 for a hundred years. Um, Jessica, I'm gonna come back to you on this one. If you could lead us off, you've written a bunch about machine politics. How ought we to think about how it interacts with the kinds of things we've been talking about? So machine politics, Chris said this earlier, machine politics can and often has in Chicago provided that institutional structure for a citywide focus. And when you have had powerful machines, um, they, I mean, Richard J. Daly was one of the most prolific builders in American history, right? So even, so, so, so even in a fragmented city, um, machines, machines can get a lot done. Um, at the same time, machines are notorious for not representing uh, communities and particularly communities of color very well. And so it's uh, it's back to that trade-off, right? So how do you create an, a structure that allows for the citywide focus, but doesn't suppress democracy in the way that machines have suppressed democracy? Let me add to and that. I think, oh, go ahead, go ahead. Let me add to that that the, that, uh, the conventional Chicago political machine, uh, you, you had a job uh, uh, cleaning sewers or, uh, or uh, passing out paper uh, in exchange for carrying your precinct. It's not gone, but it's a, a, it's a ghost of what it, of what it was. Uh, the new machine that is really uh, evolving is, is, is organized around labor unions. Uh, the teachers union in particular, uh, branches of SEIU, uh, they control money, they control forces uh, that can get you elected out in the precinct. Uh, they have lots of allies and they're not at all shy about flexing their muscle. Yeah, and I think that you know we're at this moment where Chicago voters have been expressing some 
I, I would say kind of more pro reform sentiments. I think a last mayoral election between Tony Preckwinkle and 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 Lori Lightfoot was a good example. Where Preckwinkle was to the extent that we have a machine. I mean, it's not clear. That, you know, I, I think Greg's right. We don't have the conventional old school machine, but she's the Democratic Party uh, leader. She she's very much tied into the conventional uh, sort of party bases of of power, and she was rejected in favor of Lori Lightfoot, who's who's a reformer, uh, you know, quite explicitly. Um, and and then. That, that everyone's saying that's good. We don't, you know, we don't want this political machine anymore. We don't like Madigan. We don't like that whole thing. But then almost immediately, what are people's complaint about Lightfoot? Is well, she can't get anything done. You know, nobody listens to her. She doesn't have any power. And again, I'm not saying either side is right, but that that that's the trade off. You know, now we see her as ineffective, and we need, you know, we need somebody. And I think it's gonna be interesting to see amongst the current set of candidates. You know, as Greg said, we got one candidate that's, that's clearly tied to to the unions. Um, you know, we got Chuy Garcia, who who arguably kind of has his own bit of a, a, I won't use the word machine, but he's definitely got an active political organization in Chicago, somebody like Paul Vallis, who's more in the mold of reformers. So we're kind of facing that that type of a choice again. And I, I'm, I'm curious to see how people's experience with, with watching life over the last four years might, might tip them back towards somebody who looks like a more prototypical uh, Chicago politician this time around. Jeffrey asks us to think about what the research on hybrid systems or you think about different ways more generally of designing city councils has on campaign finances that how much money goes into campaigns what do we know about that um so let me put that to the to the field what do we know and and might we think that a shift to a more at large uh, representation on the city council would lead to greater levels of engagement, more money in politics. What yeah, impact so would it have on our politics? Running for office in an at-large seat is more expensive than running for office in a districted seat or a ward seat. Um, that's nationwide. I don't have specific data on Chicago, but I can't imagine why it would be any different. Um, there's also differences in representation. So, who descriptive representation? Who is likely to get represent? Who's like likely to get elected in an at-large seat is very different than who is likely to get elected in a districted seat. We have some good evidence that women do better in in ward elections than they do in at-large um, seats. We also have. Um, a lot of data that suggests that when you have a segregated city, so segregated along racial lines or segregated along economic lines, that you are much less likely to see uh, representatives of color or representatives of low socioeconomic status getting elected citywide and they're relative to their uh, success at getting elected at the ward level. And so that's why that part, part of that trade-off is why I suggested that you would not want to approach a 50-50 split on your city council, right? You want to ensure that you do have representation of underrepresented groups, um, you know, on your city council, but providing a citywide focus um, can also be helpful. What do we know, um, Greg and Justin, if I could put this to you too, um, and, and, Chris, you started us down this road and thinking about the differences between the existing mayoral candidates. What do we, when we think about what's on the ballot um, with regards to the current slate of mayoral candidates, they are taking different positions on different kinds of issues. How are we to think about the differences in these different mayoral candidates, how they will engage the city council in particular, the extent to which they will work with them, to the extent that they'll they'll try to, to use your language, Greg, ram things down the throats of, as opposed to work in concert with um, um, uh, people on the city council. What, what's in play right now? Well, I think uh, Lightfoot's reputation has been uh, that of a uh, somebody who, who, who doesn't like to make friends and makes needless enemies. <clears throat> Um, that doesn't get along terribly well with the city council. And the riffing off of that, uh, all the candidates have, have suggested that they'll be more uh, collaborative, that they'll be more engaged, they'll, uh, they'll be coalitions and support and whatever. Um, how much of that is real, however, and how much is not is, is a little hard to tell because the issue that is overwhelming all other issues in this set campaign cycle is crime and what to do about it. Uh, whether it means stronger police, whether it means more money on uh, on uh, dealing with root causes and anti-violence efforts, a little of both. Uh, and that's what people are talking about. And the amount of tension paid to structural questions like your relationship with the city council has been minimal. I'm hoping that uh, in the runoff, and there's going to be a runoff, nobody's going to get 50%, we'll be able to drill down in some detail in the questions like that with the, with the two finalists. Chris? 
So I saw you, I saw you twitch. <laughs> uh, no, I, I, I just think uh, you know, this, we're kind of tying together, you know, a lot of the things we said at this point, which is you know, the segregation is a part of this. When you, when you have a very segregated city like we do, and then you set up a system of political representative, which is very small jurisdictions uh, geographically defined, you're going to have a bunch of people that represent probably a, a pretty homogeneous uh part of the city and nobody looking to the to the bigger picture. And so when we talk about the, the extent to which the mayor can engage the council, it's the, to some extent it's like, how does this one person who has that vantage point of the whole city engage this group of 50 people who each are concerned about some very small and specific subset of it that, that may have contrary interests and, you know, predicting amongst our current candidates, you know, like I mean, one of them is Lori Lightfoot. I don't think we have any reason to think she's going to change uh, too much. And then I think probably between Garcia and Ballas, just to focus on the three front runners, uh, my guess is they'd be pretty different, as I said, because Garcia has a has a kind of a political organization, but again, tied to one particular group within the city. So is that how's that going to play out? Is the mayor's job made easier or more difficult when we think about the kinds of reforms that are on offer? That is, you could one story is if we shrunk the size of the city council, had more of them be at large seats, that that would create for a greater alignment in the kinds of outlooks and representation that we see across the, the city council versus the mayor's office, which would facilitate um, cooperation and decision making on the one hand. On the other hand, um, and this is Greg playing off of the NASCAR race, uh, when the city council is as large and fractured as it is, the mayor can just step in and say, well, damn it, we're going to do it, right? And in that sense, if what you did is shrunk the city council and made it uh, a more formidable body, that would make life difficult for the mayor. Well, I think some of the things uh, this mayor, Lightfoot, has done uh, have helped a little bit. Um, one of the one place where she drew the line on the sand on uh, on uh, aldermanic prerogative, as it's called, uh, the ability of aldermen to do whatever they want, uh, and she said, she said, no, I'm not going to I'm not going to let you decide uh, who gets a zoning permit, uh, who gets a, a a parking permit, or who gets a, a loading zone, or all the little kind of stuff. Those are administrative decisions. They're going to be made downtown. They shouldn't belong to you. We're not going to allow you to, it's an opportunity to squeeze campaign contributions from that. Um, but that left the more contentious field because nobody here, I think, is for corruption and for, for squeezing people. That left the more contentious issue of how do you deal with these big zoning questions about the neighborhood wants it, but maybe it's good for the city, maybe it's not. Um, uh, uh, how how you deal with that and whether there's structurally a way to come up with agreement on things that divide us deeply uh, as a culture and as a city. Uh, I'm not sure there's an easy way out of that one. But you could think of, can't we not, like when we think about what's the alternative to a world in which I can call the alderman when my trash isn't picked up or when I want a speed bump or I, you know, my kid is, caught up in some catastrophe and I need individual help, that maybe the answer is not nothing, but that you have a, a healthy bureaucracy that's citywide that is attendant to those issues. And it's not a question of whether or not I'm in the favor of an alderman or I'm on a block that matters more or less to this um, alder's electoral fortunes, but it's about but at, um, core, but at core, how do you stop an alderman from representing the majority opinion in his or her turf? If people decide, I'm sorry, this is a this is a single family home neighborhood, and we don't want a bunch of high rises here. Um, uh, we can all realize the racial implications of, of of that, and say that there ought to be a way around it. But if that older person in any way is going to have to be elected or reelected, they're going to listen to majority sentiment. I think I think there's a, an important point to be made there to the well in response to that I, the. We're, there's a tendency to think of, of the kinds of reforms that we're talking about as, as being this kind of very direct trade-off between the way bureaucrats tend to think about these things, which is more from an efficiency and effectiveness standpoint, and then the representation and, as Greg was saying, of, of allowing aldermen to, to do whatever it is that the majority of the residents in their ward seem to want to do. And I think the, the recent experience, particularly when it comes to the budgeting and finance side of that, is that it's not necessarily that trade-off anymore. There have been a lot of attempts 
to incorporate things like outcome indicators into budgets. There's been a lot of attempts to try to put a, a, a racial or other uh, geographic or other sort of equity lens on the way that we think about making budgets or making infrastructure investments or whatever it might be, all designed to try to be more responsive to those local level concerns and those explicitly political concerns. And so when you think about strengthening the bureaucracy, it's not always just in service of doing things more efficiently. There is a, a, a political responsiveness and a contextualizing of those reforms that has been done a lot of other places. We've seen a little bit of that here in Chicago, but there's definitely a lot of potential to continue to go in that direction as well. To the extent that one is interested in changing the institutional design of a city council, there are politics associated with undertaking that change. Right? There are all kinds of impediments to actually pulling it off. Um, for all of you, what, what stands in the way and what looks promising when we think about this kind of institutional change here in Chicago? I like to say that whenever you approach something as big as an institutional change or trying to undo segregation or some sort of big picture item, the first thing you have to do is identify who benefits from the current system and then expect that those will be the most vocal opponents to any change that you are uh, about to produce. And so my first step would be to gather information about who likes the current system. And unfortunately, I think it's the older people. <laughs> so that's going to make it all the harder to change anything. It's kind of like asking, you know, should we should we change the Electoral College? Well, we have to get it through the Senate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree with that. I mean, the the, the, the threshold question anybody's going to ask is, is what's in it for me? Uh, is it good for bad for me? It's, you've got to it's it's a political question. You've got to convince people that there's a reason to do this. I think all that's well said. Uh, I'm with Jessica on that. I, th I think the power of the power of new information introduced into the system can't be uh, can't be overstated. And, and so we we've lots of things that could be done that might restructure those incentives in some subtle but maybe important ways. All right. So let us postulate that those politics are rough. Um, there are opponents. There will be supporters as well. I mean, that is. There are acute citywide challenges that we face, and we've talked about a bunch of them involving crime and our finances and segregation and whatnot. And to the extent that we get inadequate, not just representation of those issues, but inadequate traction in actually solving them, well, those might be the folks who fall in line and among the reform crowd and say, let us let us push, push through. Imagine they've got all the headwind. Um, and this will be my last question that I put to all of you before I invite Dylan back, um, which is you get to be dictator for a day and you get to redesign the Chicago City Council as it relates to two issues. There's lots more in play. I get it. There's lots more in play, but as it relates to two, the size and the proportion of at-large versus ward. How are you going to come out? How, if you could just if you could, you yourself change it, how would you change it? And since you've already um, taken the lead on this, Jessica, I'm going to have you go first. Um, so as I said before, I think there's there's good evidence that a third of the city council being um, elected at large can be a beneficial change. And so I guess I would I would start with that proportion. Um, as for the total size of the city council, I, I, you know, shrinking it too much too quickly. Um, might create uh, more more problems than than one would anticipate, and so I might phase in uh, something like the, an end goal of 30, 30 aldermen, um, ten of whom are elected at large, twenty of whom are are elected by ward um, over the course of some period of time. Okay, we got to phase in. Proposal number one is thirty one third two thirds. Chris, where you at? So I, I like Jessica's proposal, and I, I somewhat cop out on your question, but I would say I, I think I would be equally concerned about the number of other elected offices that we have, and and changing uh, relations of power between the council and others. And I, my own my own view is that we need an institutionally stronger mayor. We need somebody with more central authority to to really integrate all this highly fractionalized uh, power structures that we have uh, in the city and the county, and uh, and, and so on. So I would not. Absolutely at the county. 
so that I read this into the record correctly, you're doubling down on the particular reform that um, Jessica has uh, put forward, but then saying we all we got to do other things institutionally elsewhere and look for a greater. We got to rethink the the powers of the mayor. That's um, right. I, I wouldn't stop with the council. I, I think Jessica's got a good proposal, and I just wouldn't stop with the council because I yeah. think problems run run much deeper in terms of the way in which power is organized here. Great, Justin, where are you at? I'm with Jessica and Chris, and to give a specific example of one of those institutional reforms, a, a strong independent budget office that serves the needs of both the mayor and the council to try to pull together and do that integrating that Chris was describing, I think that's essential. Wow. I mean, Greg, your vote your vote doesn't matter. We're like three to, it doesn't matter how oh, you come okay. out. We've got three all backing a, a city council the size of 30, one third, two thirds. I'm going to give you I'd like to have a, so you can, yeah. I'd like to dissent. Uh, that's what I do half the time anyhow. Um, Good. Um, if I were, uh, one, I'd want to see how the elected school board situation turns out uh, that we're about to, this great experiment we're about to begin. Is it going to really give us a better school board or is it just going to be uh, the charter school advocates against the teachers unions in a very expensive process that just, that nobody votes in after a while? Um, if If we did go the hybrid model, I would limit the number of at large to a small number, five or six. Um, uh, if you're an at large Alderman, you're getting ready to run for mayor in most cases. I mean, that's just the reality of it. Um, uh, so th th there's a risk of too many people run for mayor at the same time. So maybe inject a little bit of that into the system, but I don't think I would go as far as third. And are you going to keep it at 50 or are you going to reduce it? Or are you going to increase it? Um, I would not increase it. Uh, I think somewhat of a reduction is uh, there, there's a uh, there's there's room to do it. Uh, part of the problem, though, is that uh, is that thanks to remapping and, and all the things that we have done in the way of keeping racial balance and whatever in the city council, uh, you don't have the same kind of community structure as much as you used to in this town. Uh, but in many cases, you still do. I mean, the 43rd ward is Lincoln Park. The 44th ward is Lakeview. Uh, the, the 46th ward is uptown. The 48th ward is, is, is Edgewater. There's some benefits in keeping together for our communities. Uh, Jessica, Justin, Greg, um, Chris, thank you. Thank you for engaging in this conversation and lifting up these issues. Um, Dylan, if we could bring you back. Will, thank you so much for, for leading this conversation. And again, thank you um, to Jessica, Chris, Greg, Justin, um, really valuable insights and, and contributions to what I think has been a really fascinating and timely discussion. So thanks to all of you for, for being a part of it. Um, just a quick reminder that this is just the first part of our two-part virtual symposium. Um, and we hope that you'll join us for part two entitled Power and Efficacy of the City Council Within and Beyond Chicago, which I'm sure will be another interesting um, panel discussion and expanding on some of the topics we covered here today. Um, that is happening at the same time uh, this Wednesday, February 15th. Um, and there's still time to register. Um, and you can do so on our website at effectivegov.uchicago.edu slash events. As always, you can learn more about our work at the Center for Effective Government's website, effectivegov.uchicago.edu, and um, at Cranes's website, uh, chicagobusiness.com. And we really encourage you to follow us and follow along and join the conversation on social media as well um, at UChicagoCEG on Twitter. So with that, on behalf of the UChicago Center for Effective Government and Cranes Business Chicago, Thank you all for joining us again today. Um, this was a really great discussion and we hope to see you again soon.